Hello everyone, welcome to my very first YouTube video. I'm starting tonight on the Feast of the Assumption, which is fitting because I would like to talk about how the Blessed Virgin Mary transformed my life through a trip I took to Medjugorje with my wife about a year ago. I realize that Medjugorje is a very controversial topic and I don't want to rehearse all the controversy right now. I, there are many websites out there, many YouTube videos, articles, even books about the subject arguing the pros and the cons. And that's really not the scope of my video tonight. What I would like to do instead is to talk about my own personal experience of transformation and just offer that up as a testimony with regard to the site of Medjugorje. To begin with, um, let me just say uh, a few words about the history of Medjugorje. So in um, 1981, six um, young adults, or I should say six young people at the time, um, some of them teenagers, some of them preteens, claimed that they experienced visions of the Virgin Mary in uh, the town of Medjugorje in Bosnia, Her Herzegovina, which at the time was a part of, the, uh, of Yugoslavia. And um, they claimed that they were experiencing visions every day, um, or almost every day, and sometimes more than once a day. And these alleged daily visions went on for many years. And eventually, three of the uh, alleged visionaries uh, stopped experiencing the visions daily and now claim to have visions uh, occasionally, like on certain days of the year. But three of them still claim to have the visions every day. Um, in the last almost 40 years, um, something like 40 million pilgrims have made their way to Medjugorje and many people have reported conversion experiences, uh, miraculous, uh, various miraculous experiences, um, healing, um, exper experiences of either spiritual healing or physical healing. Uh, many people have uh, found a sense of religious vocation. Uh, many priests have developed uh, uh, their religious vocation, their vocation to the priesthood after visiting Medjugorje. But the site has also been controversial. Um, there are those who claim that it is uh, a hoax or perhaps even a work of the enemy. And um, like I said, it is outside of the scope of my video tonight to try to um, argue back and forth with regard to those claims. But I would just like to make three points that in my mind point us to, or at least point me to thinking that um, the Vatican at this point at least is somewhat favorably disposed to Medjugorje. Um, one of those is that um, it, when it comes to Marian apparitions, the local bishop is usually given the competence to decide um, for or against the vision. In the case of Medjugorje, the uh, local bishop and later his successor very strongly opposed Medjugorje for a number of reasons. And again, that's a part of the larger debate about the, the whole site. Now, it, in most cases, Rome would just simply let the local bishop condemn the site and then leave it at that, and, and that would pretty much um, show the condemnation of the Catholic Church. But instead, Rome has um, taken the competency of the local bishop away, uh, the competency of judging the site, and uh, has decided that uh, ultimately the Vatican will decide um, the authenticity of the site. So in my mind, that signals that there is something of a favorable disposition in Rome, because if the Vatican wanted the site shut down, they would just let the local bishop do so. Also recently, there was a papal commission uh, to examine the site, and th uh, the recommendation of that commission was that at least the initial visions be accepted, uh, the first seven visions be accepted as authentic, and then um, a continue investigation of the ongoing claims of visions, which again, I think is significant because if Rome felt that the visions were all a hoax or the work of the enemy, then um, they would uh, not uh, allow ongoing investigation. They would just shut the whole thing down um, now. Then um, also, uh, the this commission has um, recommended that uh, pilgrimages be, official pilgrimages be allowed to be organized to Medjugorje again because for a while they were suspended. And since then Rome has actually appointed um, an official to oversee the pastoral care of the pilgrims who go there. So clearly Rome is not opposed to people making pilgrimages to Medjugorje. Now again, um, the debate will continue and in the end I will definitely submit myself to the final judgment of the church one way or the other. But in the meantime, um, I just want to relate what my experience in Medjugorje was and how that, uh, or I should say, how the experience of going to Medjugorje has transformed my life. To begin with, Medjugorje has really revitalized my prayer life. 
So just for some background, I should say that I'm, um, I was baptized Catholic as a child. I grew up in a family where um, one side was Catholic, the other was Presbyterian. And um, my dad was Catholic on, the, on my mom's side, everyone was Presbyterian. And I was under a lot of pressure to choose one or the other. And I had some ups and downs, but um, in, in the end, I fundamentally chose the Catholic Church. And so I have effectively been a lifelong Catholic. There have there have been some low points here and there, but uh, I have effectively uh, been committed to the Catholic Church. And for the last 19 years, I have um, been working full time as a lay ecclesial minister in the Catholic Church at a Catholic parish. Now, it's it's one of those sad ironies then that when you work for the church, it's actually really difficult to maintain a strong prayer life because uh, it's very easy for spirituality to um, to just be relegated to the background because, um, you, as, as they say, you know, you shouldn't forget about the Lord of the work when you're doing the work of the Lord, but it is very easy to forget uh, that we need to maintain that relationship through regular prayer. And um, it at the end of the day, it's sometimes hard to take time to pray because you've been um, uh, focused on um, the things of the church and on religious things. I guess it is a bit analogous to um, a nurse spending the whole day telling people to eat well and to exercise and to take their vitamins and then, you know, going home and, and that same nurse will eat potato chips and smoke cigarettes and, and whatnot and, and really not live up to her own advice. And um, to some extent, I fell into that trap as well. I'm not saying that I had no prayer life, but my prayer life definitely suffered. and. Um, I often went long stretches when I just did very minimal prayer. Now, as uh, I felt the call to go to Medjugorje, my desire to pray started to return. And uh, uh, once I came away from Medjugorje, I committed myself to praying the rosary um, for, well, all 20 decades of the rosary. Later, I was introduced to the Seven Sorrows Rosary, and I made a commitment to praying the Seven Sorrows Rosary as well, in addition to the 20 decades of the regular rosary. Then later, I felt a call to pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet in addition to all of these prayers, um, and also to spend at least 10 minutes uh, in meditation every day, um, and if, po you know, if possible, even more. And uh, in addition to that, I pray the Angelus prayer, and then there are some other, and the Memoraria three times a day, uh, ideally, and there are some other smaller prayers I pray in addition to that. On Fridays, I also uh, do the uh, Stations of the Cross. So um, I would say that on any given day, I probably spend you know, an hour and a half to two two hours, maybe two and a half hours in prayer. Now, I, I'm not saying that um, I, you know, I just stop everything when I'm when I do all those prayers, I, uh, I often do these prayers while I'm driving or sometimes when I'm doing chores that are uh, that don't require m uh, all of my attention. But still, my mind is focused on prayer for all of that time. So if I compare that to a time when I really didn't pray that much at all to now spending all of this time in prayer, I would say that that is a, a pretty major transformation. And in general, too, my whole sense of Marian devotion has um, been, um, I would say, um, well, if not revived, at least rejuvenated. I have, uh, over the years, I've, I've always honored the Virgin Mary, but when I was in high school and college, I had a really deep devotion to her. And, and during that time, I prayed the rosary. Uh, at the time, it was uh, the 15 decades. I would pray all 15 decades every day. And... Um, uh, it was something that was very much a part of my identity and I, I, my whole devotional life and my spiritual life revolved around devotion to the Mary and I, uh, to the Virgin Mary and I was especially devoted to saints who modeled that devotion. Uh, but something happened along the way and I, and I don't know when exactly, to be honest, I don't remember when exactly I stopped praying the rosary, but um, it just it just fell by the wayside, which is really ironic because um, back in the early days of the internet, and I realize I'm kind of dating myself here, but uh, back in the, uh, I went to college in the um, uh, early 90s when the internet was just coming of age. And at that time, I, I wrote a, um, an online post called A Detailed Guide to Our Lady's Rosary, which uh, was copied by a lot of people, placed on a lot of websites. It was um, it went viral. It was one of the first rosary guides on the internet, and it became very popular until you know other uh, better guides superseded it later. 
but um, it was, yeah, I would say in the early days of the internet, it was a fairly substantial contribution to Marian devotion on the internet. And so I, I had this um, devotion, uh, this guide to praying the rosary out on the internet, and yet I myself had stopped praying the rosary eventually. And again, I don't know when um, that happened, but I, it just fell by the wayside. And, and it didn't, re that whole practice didn't revive again until I I went to, uh, until I was starting to get ready to go to Medjugorje and then especially solidified after I came back from Medjugorje. And now, um, once again, the Virgin Mary is very much central to my devotional life and central to my spirituality. And so um, definitely um, my devotion to Mary has returned. I also developed a profound love of communion. Now, oftentimes when uh, people talk about pilgrimages, and, and I should also add that as a part of my work in uh, the Catholic Church, I, uh, I have been, been leading pilgrimages to different places. I, I led one to Italy, one to the Holy Land, uh, to World Youth Days, Days in Poland, to uh, a Marian pilgrimage to Portugal, Spain, and France. Um, and one of the objections to pilgrimages sometimes is, well, why do you have to go to the far side of the world um, when, in order to have spiritual experiences when what's really important, the most important thing you can have is right there in front of you in the tabernacle at your local church. And I would always respond to these uh, criticisms by saying that you are right. Uh, the most important thing is the Eucharist and it's right there. Um, but some people do need to go halfway across the world in order to appreciate just how important the Eucharist is. And little did I know when I made these statements that I was one of those people. I did always have a you know fundamental belief in the Eucharist and I appreciated communion, but, but it was not nearly with the, the type of deep, deep devotion that I should have had. And since Medjugorje, I've, I really have come to love receiving the Eucharist and have really come to see the immense power of, of the Eucharist and how beautiful it is and how really that is the most important thing we can do in this life. I had a very interesting experience just before we went to Medjugorje. So before uh, our trip to Medjugorje, um, we stopped in Zagreb, uh, Croatia, which is the capital of Croatia, for a few days. And there I went, uh, the night before we went to Medjugorje, I went to Mass at the cathedral in Zagreb, um, which is a beautiful cathedral, small by, by um, European standards, but very pretty. And as I was going up to communion, I just had this sense, it was, it was almost like an inner voice speaking to me. It wasn't like a voice I could hear, but it was just a deep sense that said, no matter what you experience in Medjugorje, what kind of amazing things you might experience in Medjugorje, nothing will be as important or as powerful, as meaningful as what you're about to do, which is receive Eucharist, receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of the risen Christ in the Eucharist. And that really stayed with me. And I would say that it, it has just deepened and developed ever since I've come back from Medjugorje. And now I think that if we really, really appreciated the Eucharist, then um, we would spend half our time preparing for the Eucharist and we would spend the other half of our time thanking God for giving us this amazing gift. So this definitely was a major development in my spirituality after Medjugorje. In tandem with that is um, also adoration. Um, I would go to adoration once in a while, maybe for a few minutes because there's adoration at, at my parish. And so Wednesdays, I would sometimes go in there to pray. Uh, every Wednesday there's adoration, I should say, from morning till night, and I would, you know, often go in to pray, especially because the adoration chapel is close to the office uh, where I work, and and so it was it was a nice way to to pray in the middle of the day, but um, but it wasn't a real devotion. It wasn't something that I was uh, I was doing very often, and um, after Medjugorje, I just devel developed this longing for adoration. I, I really love to go and pray, to pray the rosary there, or the Seven Sorrows Rosary, or the Divine Mercy Chaplet, or just to sit there in silence and meditate. Um, it has become a just a very important part of my spirituality. I love spending that time with the Lord. I also developed a new love of confession. So back in high school and college, and um, you know, graduate school, you know, I, I would go to confession a lot. Um, but ironically, once I started working for the church, then um, gradually, uh, I just, uh, confession started falling by the wayside. And um, 
it's again it's it's one of those things I think and it kind of an occupational hazard when um, you're you're work working with um, spiritual things all day long and sometimes it's um, it's hard to take care of your own spiritual needs uh, in that process and I would prepare other people for confession and I would tell them about the theology of confession and how important confession is how, imp how powerful it is psychologically how much they can gain from it spiritually and um, and I would encourage them to go regularly and at the same time I myself had basically stopped going and a part of it I think it was just thinking well I you know I'm not conscious of a mortal sin so I don't really need to worry about it plus it's kind of awkward um, when um, I know most of the priests who would hear my confession and what if they recognize me and you know just all of those thoughts that deter you from confession and so it became kind of a do as I say not as I, not as I do kind of situation again again kind of like the nurse who tells you to you know um, eat healthy and exercise and then doesn't do it herself uh, I fell into that trap myself now, after, when I went to Medjugorje, I didn't immediately go back to confession. I uh, didn't go to confession in Medjugorje. Uh, I did know that Medjugorje is reputed as the confession capital of the world. The most number of confessions in the world are um, heard in Medjugorje uh, of any one place. Uh, so I didn't go back immediately, but I was already scheduled to lead a Marian pilgrimage to Portugal, Spain, and France. Um, about a week and a half after I got back from Medjugorje and in the course of that pilgrimage I finally did go back to confession. I tried to go, uh, we were in Fatima, I tried to go there, I couldn't because the lines were too long and the priest left before he could hear my confession, the, the only one who was hearing confessions in English. But I did finally go in, at Lourdes and it was really special to go to confession for the first time uh, after I had fallen away from the practice um, in, at Lourdes. And it was also, it just so happened, it was my wedding anniversary and it was also my wife's birthday, which is the same day. And so it was just very special to be able to co confess my sins at Lourdes and to, um, and especially to confess all those ways that um, I, I have hurt my wife or I have um, harmed my marriage, um, just, just all of those dif uh, different sins that, that had accumulated. So it was very powerful. And since then I've been going to confession regularly, um, mostly monthly um, it didn't always happen every month but um, at least every other month and then more recently i've uh, started doing the uh, first saturday um, reparation devotion so now i uh, try to go on first saturday and if that doesn't work like as close to first saturday as possible like like the sunday after so confession has re-entered my life and i have found that to be really really powerful especially because it has helped me to see myself in a different light. I've realized that um, I did have a lot of things that I needed to worry about and that I needed to confess and I, that I had accumulated some self-destructive habits that I needed to uproot and I ne really needed to work on. And gradually with, with the grace of God and with the help of, uh, especially uh, through the Sacrament of Reconciliation, uh, I was able to uproot those habits. I'm not saying I have no bad habits now, but but I was able to uproot the, the most glaring ones that I had ignored when uh, I was not going to confession. Then also I developed a profound love of the scriptures. Now I, I've been teaching the Bible for about, uh, for over 10 years now. I do a Bible study, I teach it in RCIA and in various classes. And um, I have you know, come to know the Bible pretty well over the years. But, uh, and, I, and I do love parts of the Bible, uh, especially the Gospels, and especially, or I, I, I should say that before going to Medjugorje, I did love part, uh, many parts of the Bible, especially uh, the Gospels and um, our encounter with Christ in the Gospels. But uh, I was also infected with some of the uh, contemporary deconstructive thinking about the Bible. Um, I had seven years of Jesuit education, so um, some of that, even though I try to resist some of the, the negative ideas, some of those, um, I think, made their way into my mind, and I was very critical of certain parts of the Bible. And in a way, I did set myself up as a judge um, over some parts of the Bible. But after I came back from Medjugorje, um, I gradually realized just what an amazing gift of God the Bible is to all of us. And really the scriptures are the word of God from beginning to end, and they contain life and God's love for us from beginning to end, and we should orient our lives around the scriptures. So that was a very big change for me. 
then uh, my relationship with the magisterium changed. So again, you know, I work for the church and um, I teach a lot of different classes. And in that process, um, I, you know, I'm essentially hired to present the teachings of the Catholic Church. And, um, but I must confess that as many, many, many other people who work for the church, I've had my doubts about certain teachings, or I've had my struggles with certain teachings. And um, it, it is basically a part of the culture of American parish life, I think, and most parts that I know of, that a lot of lay ministers and a lot of priests too, um, and privately and sometimes not so privately, question certain aspects of church teaching. And um, now I have to clarify something. I, I always felt that uh, when I when I was speaking for the church, I should always present church teaching, and I should never um, try to present my own ideas in place of church teaching, uh, because I was hired to teach the teachings of the church, and I wanted to be faithful um, to that contract. But privately, I did have some doubts and and questions, and um, and did dissent on some issues, and. Um, again, I, I did not voice those in my classes, but perhaps um, some of some of the people, some of the participants in, in my programs could maybe tell um, just from my delivery. And um, now, after Medjugorje, I was gradually able to lay aside all those doubts and, and lay aside all those um, <clears throat> disagreements and to, to accept the magisterium as the teaching authority of the church which guides us into truth and which will never lose the truth so that uh, we can safely adhere to everything that the magist that comes from the authentic magisterium of the church and uh, and we will not fall into error and that we should never set our own judgment over the authentic magisterium of the church so this was a really big development in my life another very important change was my embrace of the cross um, when I was in Medjugorje, I had an interesting experience. We attended Mass. Uh, on, on a, We were there on a Sunday. The, our last day was a Sunday. And we attended Mass with about 5,000 Italians. And it was an Italian Mass um, held by a very energetic Italian priest who gave a very energetic homily. Although maybe Italians always speak that energetically. I don't know. But um, he, it was just beautiful to listen to him. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't speak Italian, so I didn't understand almost anything that he said. But I did understand one sentence, which was that the wisdom of God is the cross. Or I should say the other, the other way around. The cross is the wisdom of God. He said it in Italian, but I understood this much. I took a little bit of Italian back in college. And that sentence has stayed with me, and I have been reflecting on that sentence, and it's been growing within me. It, it is like a prophetic word that was given to me, and it has borne a lot of fruit in my life. Now, if we look at suffering, there are elements of suffering that, you know, sometimes we do need to fight. So, for example, if you, if you have a headache and you need to get a lot of stuff done, there's nothing wrong with taking Tylenol or aspirin or something like that. Or... Um, if you know if you need surgery because of a bad knee or something like that nothing wrong with seeking that um, also in, in some cases uh, suffering is because of unjust um, institutions unjust situations in the world and um, in those cases we need to fight the injustice and we need to stand up against it so um, there are elements of suffering in life that we need to fight as jesus also stood up to injustice um, in, in his own time but at the same time, there, there are types of suffering that are given to us for our growth, for our sanctification, so that we become less selfish and more God-centered. And those types of suffering we should embrace. When the cross comes to us in that way, we need to embrace that um, so that we can truly grow through it. Indeed, I would even go so far as to say that the door to heaven is in the shape of the cross. It is ultimately through the cross that we enter into heaven. So that was a very important change for me because before I would often try to get away from suffering at all costs. Uh, and some of my self-destructive habits came from trying to uh, fight suffering. And, and also I, I would say that most of the bad decisions I made were because I would try to escape from suffering. I would try to escape from the cross that God had allowed me to have for my own sanctification. I also learned the value of 
choosing suffering, suffering that is completely voluntary for the benefit of the other. You know, there's this um, idea in Catholic spirituality that we can offer up our suffering for others and we can we can take on sacrifices to offer up to others and those sacrifices will somehow benefit others in our um, in our circle, benefit others in the world. And I realize that in the post-Vatican II Church, um, the whole idea of offering up your suffering has now sounds almost old-fashioned, but I think it's one of the most powerful things that we can do. And ultimately, Jesus himself models this in the most amazing, powerful way possible by offering up his suffering for all of us. So when we offer up our suffering, we imitate others. And I mean, I should say we imitate Christ um, in his um, in his salvific work. Now, um, so basically what I've learned is that it is important to make certain sacrifices and to offer those sacrifices up for the sanctification of others and for the salvation of others. Which leads me to the next thing, which is fasting. Now at Medjugorje, Our, uh, Our Lady has asked us to fast twice a week, um, to fast on Wednesdays and Fridays from midnight to midnight, and to consume only plain water and plain bread. Um, now I should say that I am not a faster. I am really bad at fasting. Um, in fact, uh, the little fasting that um, does exist in the church today um, has still been very hard for me. So I, you know, if you look at the penitential practice of the church today, um, Catholics don't really fast in the Western Church uh, anymore that much in the Roman Rite. Uh, we are asked um, to fast on Good Friday and on um, Ash Wednesday, and that means one, well, we're to abstain from meat. Uh, but in terms of our eating, we can eat one full meal and we can uh, eat two small meals that add up to no more than a full meal, and we, we're not supposed to um, snack in between. But even so, I, I would say we're probably eating better than most people around the world on a good day. So calling that fasting is a little bit of a stretch, but it's still, it's still a sacrifice if you're used to snacking throughout the day, which um, I, you know, I'm a stress eater, so it's very easy for me to snack throughout the day. And so even um, that little bit of fasting was a challenge for me uh, every Lent. But after uh, Medjugorje, I realized that I should start um, the Wednesday and Friday fast. So I was able to um, start fasting on bread and water, plain bread and plain water, uh, because I really like um, carbonated water, but I, uh, I don't uh, drink any uh, carbonated water on Wednesdays and Fridays. So it's really important to, uh, so I, I started, uh, I realized that it's very important for me to start fasting on, on Wednesday and Wednesdays and Fridays from midnight to midnight. And that truly is amazing because, um, like I said, I, I had a problem even with um, just the minimal fasting that is that was required of us. Now, <coughs> the um, when I first did it, uh, my uh, first day was it was very difficult, and I also realized that if if I was to do it, I would also need to give up caffeine altogether. So give up coffee, which is another thing I really love. Uh, because it would be really hard not to have caffeine um, twice a week if I'm uh, dependent on caffeine. So I ended up giving up coffee as a part of this process. So that was another huge accomplishment. So um, I would say that that's a pretty big transformation for me. So I'm definitely receiving some grace. I don't claim um, the, the, the success um, through my own strength at all. I'm definitely receiving some grace um, from Mary so that I'm able to fast um, twice, twice a week for 24 hours and just on, on plain bread and plain water. And so, um, and I offer the sacrifice of that past, of that fasting for people in my life or for um, things that are going on in the world. Another um, part of my experience in Medjugorje is that I've, I've come to really love Catholic tradition. I've come to really um, see Catholic tradition as something that I want to base my life on. The liturgical year, the various customs, um, the, the, the various ways that Catholics have celebrated um, and have engaged in penitential practices throughout the years. Before Medjugorje, in many ways, I was just like many other Catholics. 
Um, I would observe the the main things of the church, uh, all those things that were required, and and you know uh, some of the maybe some of the lesser customs as well. But a lot of my life was dictated by the secular calendar. You know the different. Um, seasons that the secular world sets for us, the different movies, the different sporting events, all of those things. And I realized that really I, I want my life to revolve around Catholicism, the whole rich heritage of the Catholic Church. And there's so much there that really I could just spend my entire life just um, observing the different liturgical days and finding different ways to celebrate the different saints and the different uh, feast days of Mary and of our Lord. And all of that richness would uh, would carry me through the whole year. So I'm, I'm exploring all of that. I'm looking for different resources to find out more and more about how Catholics have historically um, celebrated different parts of the year. So all of these many, many, many things have happened in my life. and. Uh, another part of our journey too was, which will require a separate video, my wife's conversion. My wife had been away from the Catholic Church for 32 years and she too, um, or I should say, she came back to the church uh, as a result of going to Medjugorje. So she was baptized Catholic, she went to a Catholic school, but at the age of 12 um, she was bullied so much that she left the church. She became um, at first she joined Assemblies of God, then eventually she became an Episcopalian, then she became agnostic, um, and she flirted with paganism a little bit, but never went down that path. And, uh, and then she was mostly just agnostic when we went to Medjugorje. But she had some powerful experiences of Our Lady in Medjugorje. And after that, she started on this journey of growth, uh, spiritual development for, um, 10 months and almost 10 months to the day that we arrived in Medjugorje. Um, she just decided to go back to confession, which she had not done in over three decades, and she decided to start going to church again. So um, there is that powerful testimony as well, my wife's transformation, which will require a separate video. So all of these things have been happening in our lives. So I would just say, how, how could anyone say that these are not from God? How could anyone say that um, my new prayer life, my Marian devotion, the love of communion, love of adoration, love of confession, uh, my embrace of the cross, um, the love of scriptures, the acceptance of the magisterium, that all of these things, fasting, um, the desire for Catholic traditions, that all of these things uh, could possibly come into my life without God's grace, that, that somehow these aren't coming from God. I just don't see how anyone could say that. Um, I know that some people claim that Medjugorje is the work of the enemy, but I would say, do you really think that the devil would, would try to get me to do all of these things? I, I highly doubt it. Um, ever since I was little, I've experienced spiritual warfare, which, which is a separate video in and of itself. And um, I know what spiritual warfare does to a person. When, when I have succumbed to spiritual warfare, it, it pulls me away from God. It, uh, causes uh, a decrease in devotion, in prayer, in, in the love of the things of God. It, it builds anger and frustration and bitterness and, and hatred and hurtfulness. Uh, that's the fruit of the enemy, not the things that I have been describing. So if you're not sure about Medjugorje, I would just <clears throat> ask you to consider my testimony and eventually um, we'll also publish my wife's testimony just so that you can see that this is the fruit that came from Medjugorje. We feel very blessed and, and we know that the journey is not over yet. I'm sure that God will bring more fruits into our lives as long as we continue in our prayer and we continue to be open to the presence of God um, through all of these ways that, that, that he wants to give us his grace. So thank you so much for watching this uh, long testimony. Um, if you'd like to see more videos, please hit the subscribe button. Please be one of my first subscribers. And also please um, like uh, hit the um, notification button so that you will get notifications when I do post new videos. And please share in, your, uh, in the comments your experiences with Medjugorje. Um, I would just ask that you be respectful in the comments. I realize that Medjugorje can bring about a lot of heated emotions. So please be respectful and um, write in a Christian way, as they say in that song. They will know that we are Christian by our love. So let's live up to that um, song in the comment section. 
So thank you so much, and uh, I will see you next time. God bless, and may Our Lady be with you always and lead you to Christ.